Hello and welcome. I'm very excited to share with you some research we have named the Industrial Age of Hacking. I'm Tim Nosco. On behalf of my team, I hope you enjoy the show. Why are we here today? Imagine a team of hackers responsible for finding bugs in software and possibly writing exploits to demonstrate the gravity of those bugs. What skills do these hackers require to be successful? On this slide, I've laid out some skills I've personally found helpful in my career. On the top left, there is a picture of a bug, as experience in bug finding is quite helpful. Underneath, the Intel logo, because knowledge of assembly languages, like x86, will certainly help a reverse engineer. Knowledge of the ELF header structure might also be relevant. On the right side, experience with the C programming language helps when code auditing, and the CMake logo appears because understanding a program's build process can often be a prerequisite to analysis. So, does everyone on the team need to be an expert on all of these things? Does everyone need these skills to contribute? On to a bit of history. In 2016, DARPA hosted a competition named the Cyber Grand Challenge. During this event, autonomous systems competed in Capture the Flag. Computers attacked competitors' services while defending their own. The winner, Mayhem by For All Secure, demonstrated how far automated cyber reasoning advanced. This competition, however, was a bit contrived, as services ran on the Decree architecture, which was specifically designed to be simple. More work was required to apply some of these tools and methods to modern, complex software. We hypothesized this automation could advance hacking teams composed of varying skill. Now, let's focus on why my team and I were so interested in this research. In the military, we frequently have service members rotating on three-year assignments. Due to the significant overhead in training someone on all of the important skills enumerated earlier, there is little time left for meaningful on-the-job impact. So we searched for a better way forward. Our work builds off the great research by Votipka, Stevens, Red Miles, Who, and Mazurik in Hackers vs. Testers. The top of this slide shows their process. We added an additional step named targeting. Let's quickly talk about the steps in this process before addressing our improvement. The first step when hacking is to identify software to investigate. As an example, we have a critical host who exports three services, the H2O web server, digital voice services, and a mail server. Maybe we decide the web service is most important, so we target it for our campaign. Next, we attempt to see what information is available about the service. Maybe we can find the service's source code or build on progress made by someone else. Next, we identify how to run the program and how to interact with it. We might find a critical component of the web server that we interact with directly through a test harness. A test harness is some code, usually written in the C programming language, that wraps the target program in a way that makes it easier to pass data. With our harness in hand, we run millions of test inputs through the program, attempting to find those that cause the program to crash. This process is called fuzzing. Many flaws might cause a program to crash, such as attempts to read an invalid memory pointer or writing data over the stack canary. Featured here is the fuzzer honk fuzz, if it appears our fuzzer is not making progress, indicated by the amount of code it has covered, we return to the program understanding step. After running the fuzzer for some time, we search the corpus for bugs. We attempt to make sense of them in the program's context. Finally, we write a report to communicate our findings and the impact they might have. During a team meeting, Jared asked a potent question. His question prompted us to mix the work of Votipka with our experience using automation and leading teams. The question was, how can we use automated tools to help our less skilled hackers contribute? Before we describe what we learned, let me first describe the prevailing method, a depth-first search. In this method, hackers apply Votipka's process sequentially. Out of many potential targets, the team selects a single one and uses a lot of time and energy to find bugs. Without any prior indication of success, this is a lot like diamond mining. The payoff is high, so the team is willing to invest a lot in searching and digging. The problem here can be summarized with one word, risk. The payoff is high if we can find a bug in a very critical service, but the payoff is zero if there is no bug to be found or if we cannot find it. 
Worse, the prevailing method underutilizes automation and leaves apprentices behind. In order to maximize our return on investment, we should instead focus on how to predict the presence of a vulnerability and weigh that against the cost of both skill and time. We derive from this model our favored method, breadth first. In this method, we apply Votipka's process in a breadth first search. We accomplish this by labeling hackers based on their skill and applying them to targets sequentially. Instead of having an entire team review one target, we have apprentices review many targets. They can help predict both the presence of bugs and the costs associated with future work. This leaves more advanced hackers to review more promising targets. This figure gives more detail on our process and the specific job roles it employs. Our insights are, first, treat this as a pipeline to be executed in parallel. Second, optimally use the skill of each team member by maximizing the time they spend in the step they are best suited for. Hence the title of our paper, Hacking in the Industrial Age. Because we're filming a USENIC's lightning speed video, you'll have to read our paper for more details. I found that when explaining research to high-ranking officers, using metaphors is best. So this is my executive metaphor. When hacking, we search for bugs. Instead, let's pretend we're fishing. Here you can see a school of fish. Let's also say we're fishing with a net. If we use a net with very tiny holes, like the person in this picture, we're definitely going to catch all the fish who are trapped in the net. The problem is that the net has a lot of drag in the water and requires a lot of skill to use correctly. If instead we use a lower skill net, we might lose some fish. On the other hand, we can drag it through more water and thus increase our chances of interacting with the school. Great. We're a significant way through the presentation. So far, I've just asked you to believe that I know what I'm talking about. But fortunately, we're rigorous scientists and we've come up with an experiment to test the two methods, breadth and depth. We recruited 12 hackers of varying skill and put them through a quick training session and then grouped them into two teams of six. Each team spent a work week performing each method in a counterbalanced design. This gave us the opportunity to perform both between subject and within subject tests. What did our hackers look at? We considered many existing benchmarks, such as DARPA's Cyber Grand Challenge binary set, Google's Fuzzing Benchmark Suite, and MIT Lincoln Lab's Rodeo Day problem set. Ultimately, we decided on something else altogether, OpenWort. OpenWort is an open source Linux router firmware with a package manager that exports thousands of open source packages. Selecting this resource ensured our targets were complex and representative of real deployed software. We selected an old version of OpenWord that was sure to contain bugs. Participants were heavily monitored. We made very precise schedules. We told them when to take surveys, when to eat, when to take their coffee, when to sleep, just kidding. We also assigned two team leads to ensure their team applied the correct method at the correct time. We set up some services for the teams, such as a rocket chat in GitLab. We also came up with a nice workflow that uses GitLab's Kanban board to track issues as they move through the hacking process defined earlier. Now, if this process is interesting to you, I hate to sound like a broken record, but you should seriously read our paper. On to the results. First, I'll talk about the survey results. I've only chosen a few significant responses for this presentation, but the paper contains many more. For the responses here, I've used the Bernoulli trial to answer the question, what is the probability this response is not applicable to the sampled population? For clarity, the lower the p-value listed, the more likely the response of the greater community matches the response given. So for the first question, which vulnerability research method do you feel was more effective? Our participants responded breadth first. On a side note, I've included some nice background pictures that have nothing to do with the experiment, but make the questions more fun to look at. Which vulnerability research method do you think made the best use of your team's skill? Breath first. Which vulnerability research method do you think is easier for a novice to contribute to? Unanimously, breath first. Did you learn any valuable skills during the experiment? Unanimously, 
Yes. How many bugs did you find during the experiment? Every participant reported finding at least one bug. Let's talk about a more objective measure of each method's effectiveness, bugs found. This table shows bugs found by running each team's harnesses in three independent fuzzing runs, trials 0, 1, and 2, here labeled T0, T1, and T2. Each horizontal record captures a team's output when applying one of the two methods, depth first or breadth first. We ran each of our 12 jobs on Mayhem for 24 hours. The center records highlight that Breath First found more bugs. In fact, it found in order of magnitude more bugs. There is a statistically significant difference in the means of the Breath First and Depth First methods. If you'd like a more detailed analysis of these numbers, including how we determine number of bugs, take a look at the results section of our paper. When reviewing the mountains of recorded data, Drew Barbarello noticed a difference in the amount of documentation for each method. He plotted the cumulative amount of documentations over time. This includes GitLab projects and commits, GitLab issue actions like creation, comments, and tags, and Rocket Chat messages. For both weeks, the rate of change for Breath First is higher. And finally, we're at the end. I hope I have kept things interesting, and I hope you'll go read our paper. In it, you'll find an excruciatingly detailed description of our experiment. If you plan to repeat it, will gladly answer questions about our design. In the paper, you'll also find a more detailed description of our workflow. I hope by now I've convinced you not to strip mine for diamonds. Instead, build your own bug assembly line and enter the industrial age of hacking. I'm Tim Nosco. On behalf of my team, thank you.